Our uh, illustrious uh, guest uh, speaker is John Nixick. Uh, he is Emeritus Professor in the Southeast Asian Studies Department of the National University of Singapore. His book, Singapore and the Silk Road of the Sea, won the inaugural award for best book on Singapore history in 2018. His specialties include historical archaeology of Southeast Asia, urbanization, trade, and ancient Buddhism, in addition to ceramics. He is currently uh, a lifetime member of the Southeast Asian Ceramic Society and is currently serving as president of the same society. So friends, let us welcome uh, Dr. Mixik and uh, let us enjoy uh, what he has to share with us this afternoon. Yes, Dr. Mixik. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen now. All right, thank you very much for that the kind introduction of Father Tony. And I'd like to thank also uh, the Friar Rios University for giving me the honor of being invited to speak on this, this is a very special occasion. It doesn't happen very often that uh, things are commemorated 500 years after they took place. Um, Ferdinand Magal Hayes' voyage was special, obviously because it marked a fundamental change in the way humans viewed their world and its shape. And so its repercussions still reverberate today from the standpoint of this viewpoint of where humans stand in the universe. Uh, the subject of gold in particular always has a special aura also. I'll try to add some words, but it's always easy to, um, to uh, entertain just by sharing beautiful pictures. So I have an advantage when we talk about gold. Uh, when I started studying Southeast Asian gold almost 50 years ago, Indonesian gold was already uh, much appreciated. In the 1990s, early 2000s, the Wono Boyo Horde from Central Java, studied by the uh, curator at the National Museum of Indonesia, Wahyono Artokrido, and others attracted lots of attention. Uh, so did the Hunter Thompson collection, which I had the privilege to study. The Blitum ship's cargo of the 9th century also is well known, though it's Chinese. And it never made it to its port, intended port, uh, so it had no influence on history, but it's having influence on how we now view the relationship between China and Southeast Asia, and I'll say something more about that later. In the last 15 years, though, the center of attention of gold studies has shifted to the Philippines. The Luxon collection, especially, and no less the scholarship of Filipino scholars, such as Nina Baker, Victor Estrella, and theoretical works by Migs Canilao, are at the forefront of a new wave of genuine progress in the field. Um, he doesn't work specifically on gold, but uh, also mentions Steve Acobado, whose work also on the highland-lowland relationship I will refer to directly when I talk about the role of gold in Southeast Asian society a bit later. Uh, so in the next hour or so, I'll show my appreciation for the work of these Filipino scholars by putting gold into the larger context of pre-colonial Southeast Asia. As I've argued, gold has a special value for such research, but also poses special challenges. The Philippine archipelago are, occupies the northeast corner of Southeast Asia, very early examples of a number of early forms of material culture associated with the area now occupied by speakers of Austronesian languages in Brunei, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, China, as well as Oceania are found in the Philippines. These include pottery, carved hard stone, and gold. This doesn't prove that they were all invented in the Philippines, but it shows that they were, at least the Philippines was very early involved in their development. The archeologist, I'm sure most of you have heard, uh, know of Wilhelm Solheim, coined the term Nusantau to refer to this complex of material culture 
to distinguish it from Austronesian language. The styles of material culture and the language and the DNA, as we're now finding out as well, in this vast region are similar but not identical in dispersal. The Philippines was among the earliest places where these art styles appeared. They were present in firmly established forms in the late centuries before the Common Era. The Philippines and Taiwan were centers of development of new forms of personal adornment and technology for making the ornaments from hard stone before gold came along, partly because both areas, the Philippines and Taiwan, have the raw material for making them. From this region, the artifacts, production techniques, and styles spread across South China, the South China Sea, to the Mekong Delta, the Kingdom of Okeo or Funan, and the Malay Peninsula, Kaosam Keo, I'll talk about a bit later. Interestingly, these artifacts, such as the Ling Ling O, do not appear in Indonesia. At least they haven't been found there yet. But the earliest dated examples of gold working appear in mainland Southeast Asia, Northeast Thailand, and Eastern Cambodia on the fringes of the Mekong Delta. This is surprising because gold is much less easily obtainable there compared to the area along the equator from Sumatra, Malay Peninsula, Borneo, Southern Philippines. Uh, this uh, may reflect a lack of data rather than the real situation, but that's kind of the way it is at this moment. By 2000 years ago, seafarers from Southeast Asia were sailing across the northern shores of the Indian Ocean as far south along the coast of Africa as Madagascar. From the Indian Ocean, these sailors and traders brought back a writing system and concepts of religion and political organization. At the same time, the Han Chinese were conquering the Yue kingdoms of what is now southern China and incorporating them into the Han sphere. The Philippines was the only area of Southeast Asia which was relatively untouched by these phenomena. The absence of Indic cultural elements in the Philippines has puzzled many analysts, and Nina Baker, of course, has written extensively on this. Uh, Filipino societies were in contact with mainland Southeast Asia by 2,000 years ago, and with the kingdoms of Java and Sumatra by the 9th century, if not much earlier. The reasons why Filipino cultures did not adopt more Indic traits is clearly not due to a lack of familiarity with them not because the Philippines were isolated in any way. That was not a cause. Instead, the reasons for the preservation of traditional cultural practices and art styles in the Philippines must be sought in conscious decisions of the Filipinos. In this talk, I'll discuss the importance of pre-Hispanic gold working styles in the Philippines for our understanding of proto-historic Southeast Asia and the evidence for continual contact between the Philippines and other coasts of the South China Sea until the arrival of the Europeans around 1521, which gold objects can provide. Now, I'm a cultural archaeologist, you could say. Um, I'm mainly interested in using artifacts to reconstruct ancient societies and not as objects in themselves. My main interest is Southeast Asian ceramics and secondarily other Asian pottery, but I became interested in gold when I was doing my first research in Northeast Sumatra, up there, in 1977 at a site called Kota China. My colleague Edmund Edwards McKinnon found some stone molds for making rings and some pieces of gold leaf with Chinese characters, giving a purity of the gold in the Chinese system of 1 to 10. While I was studying the earthenware from the site, I noticed a number of small cups with a greenish stain on the interior, I had the suspicion that they might be connected with goldsmithing, so I showed them to a Chinese goldsmith in Malaysia who recognized them as crucibles for melting gold. The green stains he identified as traces of borax, which Chinese goldsmiths use as a flux. My main research topic, though, was tracing the economic and cultural links between lowland ports in the Straits of Malacca and the hinterlands. For this reason, I'm very interested in the line of research being pursued by Michael Kanilao. I think it has great potential for illuminating the nature of highland-lowland relations in Southeast Asian history as a whole. 
And Steve Acabado has also done work along the same lines on the ethno-historical side. I recently gave a talk for a conference organized by Cambridge University about the idea of zomia, which social scientists such as von Schendel and later uh, James Scott developed to explore the relations between the famous lowland kingdoms such as Angkor and Srivijaya and the surrounding areas. Uh, too often in the past, the relationship has been viewed as dominant subordinate or civilized versus primitive. For example, Bennett Bronson's upstream downstream model. Uh, the Zomia perspective emphasizes the voluntary and symbiotic nature of the relationship. Lowland kingdoms depended on the highlands for many of their exports and food. The highlands depended on the lowlands for basic commodities like salt, iron, and cloth. So, um, Alcota, China, the site in Northeast Sumatra, uh, this is in the same area where Marco Polo actually spent six months on his way back to the Mediterranean. After spending 20 years in China, he sailed with the Yuan Dynasty fleet, which was going all the way to Persia. And they had to stop off at the northern tip of Sumatra for six months because that was the end of the Northeast monsoon. They had to wait around in the Straits of Malacca for the monsoon to return to blow them further west. And uh, the same occurs with the Cheng He fleets when they sailed through Southeast Asia in the early 15th century on the way to the Indian Ocean. Uh, when the Chinese arrived in the Straits, usually at the northern tip of Sumatra, they built a stockade. And they stayed there for five months to wait the return of the Northeast Monsoon. So this was a Kota, a China, uh, China Chinese fort. So we don't know why this particular village, as it was when I got there, I uh, got the name Kota China, but it seems likely that it was a, one of the first maybe overseas Chinese settlements. Uh, they might have had both Chinese and Indian semi-permanent residents there. It was a mangrove swamp at the back end of the small river delta of the Daly River, northeast Sumatra, exploring around in the mangrove swamps. There were lots of remains of broken pottery on the surface, which turned out to be Song Dynasty Chinese ware, um, and lots and lots of locally made pottery. Uh, further excavation with the Indonesian Archaeological Department yielded remains of brick temples, uh, both Buddhist and also Hindu, both Vishnu and Shaivite, statuary and so on. Uh, and uh, lots and lots of Chinese wares as well. So it really seems to have been a very early uh, port of trade. And among the objects recovered there were both these little crucibles. Here you see them with the green stains still on them from the borax and other elements of uh, gold smithing, such as this mold for making a ring and so on. And so it was in the context of figuring out the relationships between this lowland site and the highlands of North Sumatra that I started working on gold, its transfer, its importance, and so on. I moved to Singapore in 1987 and um, got involved with the National Museum of Singapore, which already had a gold collection of its own uh, in Southeast Asian, mainly Indonesian, and uh, then they had a guest uh, display of the Hunter Thompson collection called Ancient Javanese Gold. And they published a small catalog in 1988. Here's uh, some of the artifacts of the Thompson collection on display there. And then I wrote a, a, my first book about the subject. These are two different covers which were developed for it about old Javanese gold. And um, one of my objects in writing that book was to bring greater scholarly attention to the subject, which I thought was being left too much to the art historians and uh, just the collectors. And one thing I hoped was that people would actually start to copy it again, to bring it back to life. And this is a, this is a, a story from the Singapore Straits Times, which came out just last month about um, museum pieces still being revived to take on life as new uh, jewelry. So this is what I've been hoping. And it seems to be taking some traction again that these old uh, designs will be used as inspiration by modern artists, as I think it a, a, has a lot of uh, hope for getting the interest of the younger people, especially, to get interested in their own uh, traditions back before the modern period and respect for these various kinds of designs and hopefully some interest in the history of the cultures that created them. Now, there were two scientific conferences held, um, one in the Netherlands under the the Royal Tropical Institute. Uh, these are the two publications that came out of those seminars. And uh, this, of course, it was around that time or slightly later that I got to know Michael Kanilau, 
and I um, wrote a little bit of an introduction for his book. And his his work is highly theoretical, as most of you will know who read it, but it's extremely cutting edge. And it's got lots of potential to be employed and adapted in other uh, parts of the world. So I'm extremely happy to see how much progress he's been making. Uh, this is Hunter Thompson himself, along with John Guy, another art historian many of you will know. This is um, about 20 years ago, along with the museum uh, cur uh, uh, curator of Cecilia Levin and Pauline Skurlier, the, the Dutch uh, specialist in ancient uh, Southeast Asian, mainly uh, Javanese uh, sculptures. Um, and this is the Yale University Art Museum, to which Hunter Thompson's collection eventually was donated. And uh, so there was a whole gallery given to a special exhibition about his uh, collection. This is a, one of the crowns in the collection. You can see it's quite a large display area, which is given to that. And now it's a permanent part of the Yale University collection. And uh, Yale University then did publish this book as kind of an updated version of my old 1990 book on old Javanese gold with more uh, materials in it. And uh, there was also another scholarly meeting held at that time. And out of the uh, various papers presented at that uh, symposium, I want to call special attention to the one at the bottom by Ian Glover. Collectors and archaeologists with special reference to Southeast Asia. So this is a, a fraught subject, especially now with the um, revelations about the process of looting of various objects from Cambodia, especially the Latchford collection or collections and the various kinds of um, discussions that are taking place about the, the, the ethics of this kind of use of pieces uh, exported illegally from the countries of origin and whether scholars should work on them or not. So this is an ongoing discussion, but Ian Glover's comments on this, I think, are well worth heeding. So anyone who's interested in discussing this topic should read Ian's uh, contribution to this symposium. Now, Zomia, uh, this is the kind of geographer's version of it by Walter von Schendel. Later, James Scott popularized it. Uh, it has two actual regions. One is Central Asia, kind of the Tibetan plateau, and the other is the Southeast Asian mountain massifs. They're actually quite different ecologically speaking. But the idea is that these are areas which have never been really fully integrated into any large-scale kingdoms. Now, um, similarly, Bennett Bronson, way back in the 1970s, came up with this upstream-downstream model, as he called it, um, which stipulated that the highlands would always be subordinate to the lowlands in places like Sumatra. And you could say the Philippines fits into the same model also, uh, because the ports at the river miles would have controlled access to long-distance maritime trading systems. But as I have argued, and as Pierre-Yvonne Longuin also has, uh, Bronson's model is much too simple and is, uh, it gives much too much agency to the lowlanders at the expense of the highlanders. I argued, in, and this is an article I wrote in Indonesian about uh, central place models being also important. And of course, uh, this is related to Wakani Lau's work on uh, geographic systems. And so Pierre Mongen, who uh, I believe you will be listening to tomorrow, and I modified Bronson's model to show that there was a lot more complicated system between highlands, lowlands, various river valleys, and overseas trading partners than Bronson's model. And the highlanders had a symbiotic and equitable relationship with the lowlanders rather than being subordinate to them because of their location. There was no such thing as geographical determinism. So looking at Southeast Asia, this is a map from old Javanese gold showing the various locations where gold is mainly found. And it is, of course, in this belt of mineralization right along the equator um, between Sumatra across to Borneo and into the southern and central Philippines. Signs of early gold exploitation or acquisition are very difficult to find. A lot of it is just done by panning. And this is modern panning still being done in river valleys in North Sumatra, the same general area which I studied. And uh, people just make these little sluices in the riverbeds. They screen them. And um, these are just look like natural features and archaeologists should not be able to recognize them. So it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to recognize this in the archaeological record. There were mines when the Dutch got to Sumatra 
in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, uh, they found extensive mining, uh, lots and lots of sophisticated, not just uh, surface mines, but also shafts, dual shafts sometimes, so that you could have one shaft for the workers going down, another shaft for removing the, the rocks, and also for removing things like the smoke, because they often used uh, the fire and water technique to crack the rocks. This is the remains of a very large mortar and pestle in the Sumatran highlands, which the Dutch discovered. This is for grinding up the gold ore, which was usually in the form of veins of, in quartz rocks. And this is, these are now in the Geological Museum at the Institute of Technology in Bandung. So there were a few of these types of things which were noticed by the colonists, but for the most part, they just happily set up their own mines on top of them, such as this gold mine in the residency of Bunkulu, Highland Sumatra. And so a lot of the old gold mines, of course, just got obliterated by the more contemporary mines. And when I was actually living in Bunkulin for two years from 1979 to 81, and uh, there was a mining, a, a Western mining company, which was doing more research in the area. And they, uh, one of the geologists I talked to said, yes, they did discover uh, quite a number of traces of ancient mining, but they set up their own mines on top of them. So again, there was no research done. Um, it will be now, I think, uh, quite difficult to find any undisturbed ancient gold mines in Southeast Asia. So we're not likely, of course, it's not impossible, highly unlikely we'll ever know much more than we already do, very cursory descriptions in the early colonial period about what mining was like in Southeast Asia. It did exist. It was sophisticated, but yeah, but beyond that, I don't think we'll ever be able to say very much. Now, these are the highlands of West Sumatra, of the Binkulu area, very fertile, Actually, they supplied a lot of the food for the lowlanders because they had the abundant water supplies, fertile volcanic soil, and uh, malaria was not really a problem in the highlands. So they were, in many ways, the centers of early civilization in Western Indonesia, the highlands, not the lowlands. The majority of the population lived in the uplands. They created these kinds of prehistoric um, mural painting. This is from the Pasama region. This is a it's, it's kind of a looks like a kind of a bird monster and this perhaps an elephant here. And um, like in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, there were still enormous quantities of indigenous gold working to be found there. These are some of the photos taken by early ethnologists in the Bunkulu area, looking at the theory, of which of course does not exist anymore. They got melted down, changed into modern types but of course, you'll see that there are some fairly strong similarities to some of the early Filipino gold designs, as well as more recent things such as the chains, uh, amulets worn by the people on the right here. Uh, so, but uh, when the, the first colonists really occupied this area were the British in 1685. This is the port in Bunkulu. And this was the governor of the fort, York Fort, as it was called, which was on this hill, which I did some excavations on. Again, looking for traces of the evidence of early communication between the colonists, in this case, the British in the 17th century, and the Highlanders. And this is a statue of the governor of that fort, who later on went to become the governor of Madras. So he, he made his fortune really in Bunkulu, and then went off to Madras, and of course got a very plumb position there. And in our excavations, we did find remains of some of the gold jewelry that probably was made for him. And so uh, this is very likely, he does mention it briefly in his writings, but he didn't know where it came from. The British never explored the highlands. They just um, acquired these things from people who brought it down from the highlands. So they were very much at the mercy of the highlanders in the Rajang, Labong area and so on to get supplies of this gold. Now, the oldest uh, gold objects that have been dated by carbon-14 are from Nunolo, one of the excavations by Charles Hyam. They're in the form of these beads. Um, but whether or not Cambodia actually had gold of its own, well, it did have gold of its own. Uh, we know that, but it's highly unlikely that there's being exploited this early. Most of the early references that we have to Cambodia and the Chinese sources and others um, so this suggests that Cambodia was importing its gold. From where, we don't know. Um, but we do know that uh, the, the site of Okeo, uh, the kingdom of Funan, 
was in contact with, well, a place called the Don Don Islands, which most historians think is the Philippines. This is in about the third century, and they were importing iron from the Don Don Islands. And so it seems likely that uh, the gold that was also being worked in Cambodia by the third century was also imported from the same general area. Now, beads, of course, are one of the most common types of items found everywhere, but still, there's such a wide range of different types of beads that uh, the study of beads alone has always attracted large numbers of people. Um, one of the main experts in this field was Peter Francis, who, whose works on Southeast Asian beads is still um, basic. But um, no, I haven't seen, a, uh, well, I've seen some uh, small studies uh, comparative of the various beads in the region. The ones in the left from the Philippines, the ones in the right from Indonesia. There's just such a huge range of designs of these that it seems like it's a daunting subject for anyone. Um, but still, it's a very interesting field to pursue. But so I want to make reference now a little bit to works of Victor Estrella and the importance of the cult of the ancestors, not just in the Philippines, but in Southeast Asia. And this, for the late prehistoric period, seems to have been the major form of religion that existed before the Indic religions came into some areas in Southeast Asia. And right up until the 20th century, some groups of people, not only in the Philippines, but throughout Indonesia, places like Sulawesi, Borneo, um, were also carving these wooden statues of the ancestors. And they were very important as a kind of main contact between human beings and the supernatural. The ancestors being able to then either protect or to harm their descendants, depending on whether they were properly uh, propitiated. And as you can see, the statues of the ancestors all look the same. This means that, as far as we can tell, uh, the ancestors did not retain their personalities upon death. It was not like the Chinese system, for example, where you could pray to your own ancestor, your own grandmother, or so on, when they died, uh, because after a certain length of time, uh, sometimes stipulated as 12 years, the individual consciousness would not exist any longer, except the individual kind of identity would be reabsorbed into a giant over soul. And so that's why the ancestors all look the same, because they are all the same being, the same entity after a certain length of time. And it seems that uh, some of the earliest gold in places like Java, such as these face masks, were then given to the ancestors uh, upon their burial. There are lots of theories about why uh, gold was used in the form of masks like this. One is that it is a form of respect to adorn the ancestors with this rare and precious kind of material. Another one, however, is that uh, in some places in Indonesia in particular, ethnographically, we know that once the, um, the person was dead, then it was worried that they might um, actually bring harm to the village where they came from. And so the corpses were not taken out through the main door. They were taken out through a window or some other kind of temporary exit. And then they were misled. They were, um, in a way, they were tried to make confused so they couldn't find their way back to the village and uh, take revenge on the people because they were not happy at being dead. And um, sometimes they were also covered up so that they couldn't uh, see. So this is another possible reason why we have these gold masks and other kind of face covers in the prehistoric sites. These are other Javanese versions. Sometimes they were just for the eyes and the nose. Uh, but of course, we can't really tell. This is one of the main problems working on gold, of course, is that you never or almost never have complete information on the contexts they come from. So uh, these are various versions of the Javanese types, often made out of very pure gold, just hammered cold into these various shapes. And uh, some uh, examples from the Philippines again, such as the one at the upper left, the one at the right, maybe more recent, about this kind of gold working technique began in the prehistoric period in the areas where there were large quantities of gold to work with. And uh, it still continued on into more recent times, but the process of covering eyes and noses for the most part uh, did not, although it did still continue in places like Bali until uh, the 20th century. Other kinds of sheet gold, again, the technology of gold working, um, using almost pure gold and just beating it out into flat shapes continued for a very long time. It's not only found in ancient times, prehistoric times that continue right on up into quite recent periods. 
Now, uh, another the connection between gold and ancestors has to do with mountain sites. And this is particularly true in Java, where there was not a real cultural difference between people in the highlands of the volcanoes and people in the lowlands. They were all basically the same ethnic identity of Javanese, although there were are still a few remnant groups in places like West and East Java, the Tengera, the Badui people who do maintain their separation from the lowland groups and still maintain what they consider to be pre-Islamic, pre-Indic Javanese culture. But for the most part, the uplands were seen as pilgrimage places by the lowlanders. And it was the places where both the ancestor spirits could be con contacted and also where people would go to undergo various kinds of rituals, prayers, um, consecrations, and they would perform these kind of ascetic um, uh, kind of self, uh, um, um, well, not uh, 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 kind of ascetic practices. And this is one of these kind of ascetic figures just depicted in this kind of pendant on the right. Uh, gold was also seen as a symbol of wealth as far back in Javanese history as we can tell by the, the, the early ninth century sites like Borobudur, Prambanan were adorned with these kinds of trees, uh, which in Sanskrit are known as the Kalpataru. And they're seen as also being kind of emblems of wealth. And so the trees themselves are a source of fertility. And along the bottoms of them, often you have these big jars full of jewels. The, the, the god known as Hinduism as Kuera, or in Buddhism as Jambala, he was a symbol of wealth. This is him on the right, shown with his foot on top of another pot full of jewels and so on. So wealth in terms of gold and other jewelry definitely did equal social status. In some societies, in the lowland societies in particular, in much of Southeast Asia. And here you see these two creatures at the bottom of the tree here, kind of either paying adoration to the tree or giving something to the tree. These are the Kinara, or the half human, half bird figures. Of course, one of the famous pieces assumed to be from Butuan also depicts a figure like this, and we'll discuss them a bit more later. So there were other kinds of jewelry as well. Not all jewelry in ancient prehistoric Southeast Asia was made out of gold. That's the type most people like to collect. But in places like the highlands of Sumatra, such as the area of Pasama, um, which had that uh, cis grave with the mural painting I showed you earlier, uh, these statues of what seemed to be either heroic humans or possibly deities, they were also found together with jewelry made out of other forms of material, such as bronze, uh, sometimes copper um, as well. And so not all jewelry was gold. But uh, very few people have studied the non-gold jewelry. It will be very interesting, however, to pay more attention to this, but very few of these have been even collected or published, as far as I can discern. Now, in Cambodia, late prehistoric period, there were also indigenous art styles, which were unique to the region. These kinds of uh, bronze symbols, here, uh, kind of like a, a pendant or a bell at the left, these obviously I have some reference to kind of buffaloes, the horns on this kind of helmet or epaulets as well. And uh, it's during this late prehistoric period that we get this first large cache of gold jewelry in a place called Prohir, which is along the Cambodian border with South Vietnam. But that is also found in connection with bronze objects such as Dong Son material. So it goes back several centuries before the beginning of the Common Era. And it's, again, there's a large amount of gold here. It's been noted that by recent scholars that there are maybe 19 or 20 different sites of gold um, ore in Cambodia. But as I said before, also most of the reports we have from early Cambodia itself seem to imply that their gold was imported, not acquired from local sources. Iron Age beads also from, uh, probably from Cambodia. These are from private collections, so we can't be sure. Uh, again, many, many different varieties of resinous cores. Uh, in this case, of course, resin is a good thing for the archaeologist because it's organic material. And so you can date this by carbon-14. Now, uh, some of these come from the infamous Latchford collection, such as the ones at the right here. So that's quite an unusual shape. The one at the left is quite common. I show the one at the right because it's unusual. I don't know of any examples of this. And uh, other things from the, the Latchford collection. 
uh, the wreath with a Mediterranean style closure, uh, just said to be from the South Mekong Valley. The belt with a great motif, again, that is seen as being a reference to Western art. And um, the intaglio rings here, which are probably imported from the Mediterranean. So South Mekong, this is basically implying the area of uh, Alkeo, right? We now call it Alkeo culture. Uh, because that's what the Vietnamese archaeologists preferred to call it after the largest site of this period, which the Louis Malare, um, which Nina Baker, of course, has referred to often, uh, he excavated the site in the 1940s after it had already been extensively looted. But there is so much gold working going on here uh, that there was still gold to be found until quite recently. And the Alkeo culture, there are about 300 sites of this culture now, now, now known, and it was in close contact with at least South India, where these kinds of romantic uh, Hellenistic objects could be found and possibly even with the Mediterranean itself. So the ethno-linguistic affiliation of the people of the Mekong Delta during the Alkeo culture is not known. Uh, the only inscriptions found in the Mekong Delta are in Sanskrit. They're not in Mon or Khmer or any other Southeast Asian language. In the early 7th century, Alkeo culture and the, what the kingdom of the Chinese referred to as Funan both disappear and no kingdom or culture, advanced culture or city ever developed in its place again. The Mekong Delta was kind of on the margin of society for the next thousand years. Instead, the lower Mekong became part of the Khmer ethno-linguistic realm while the southeast coast of Vietnam uh, northeast of Okeo was populated by the Cham, where, of course, Malayo-Polynesian speakers. It's possible that the Funan or Okeo culture was a hybrid combination of Cham and Khmer, which later broke into two spheres, one going up the Mekong and becoming um, the Kingdom of Angkor, the other going up the East Coast and becoming the Cham kingdoms. In the 1940s, the Mekong Delta was still inhabited by a mixture of two groups, the Khmer, and Vietnamese, one living on the higher ground on the river levees, created by the Mekong's tribute, uh, um, uh, kind of distributaries, and the other on the lower wetlands. So this might have been a long-standing pattern going back 2,000 years. So this might be ancestral to both Khmer and Cham kinds of wares. Uh, these are later, uh, probably, uh, well, they're probably Alkeo period types of objects also from the Mekong Delta. Again, the problem with these uh, looted objects is that we have no real way of dating them except by style, and we don't have enough objects dated by actual either stratigraphy or carbon dating to actually tell whether or not that's an accurate means of using them. Of course, the, later on, the, the naga, or the cobra here, becomes an important kind of symbol. How really that began in Cambodia, again, we don't know for sure. And going into the classic period then, we get the statuary, we get these other kinds of ritual bowls, which are interested to compare with those from places like Java, where you have more contextual information about them. Um, so these uh, two cultural formats, one in which the Malayal Polynesian ideas about afterlife were perpetuated, where you have the burials with uh, offerings, and uh, another in which different ideas about the soul were formulated, and then led to cremation, that they continued to exist side by side right up until the 20th century. They were not only found in uh, the Philippines, they were found in other parts of Southeast Asia too. But perhaps we'll never know the real answer to the question of why these new ideas about cremation appeared. It might be more of a philosophical than a rational matter. It might also have something to do with the role of culture as a means of the adaptation to the environment. Certain modes of political organization may be better suited to living in dispersed settlements and roving the forests or the seas on collecting expeditions, while others are better for managing societies where foreign contacts are more important. My own suspicion is that this highland, lowland division developed when maritime trade became an important feature of Malayo Polynesian life around 2,500 years ago. Uh, economic specialization led to the formation of explorers of the mountain forests, explorers of the seas on smaller islands, and explorers of maritime trade routes on the larger rivers. 
these are other kinds of ear ornaments, which you can see they have some similarities to ear ornaments owned from Java, other parts of Southeast Asia, but they also have some differences. They're extremely detailed. They have these sharp projections sticking out of them. Uh, so one can say that there is kind of a common root of these kinds of ear ornaments in the probable either South Mekong or maybe further north uh, in the Cambodia region. But there are also some local differences which do emerge. But again, this will remain purely, purely speculative, undateable until we have real archaeological information. This is from the book by the art historian Emma Bunker and Latchford on Khmer gold gifts for the gods. And it shows how some of these objects might have actually been used as adornments for statues. So they might have been for human beings, but they might also have been for adorning the statues of the gods themselves. This, of course, is speculative, but it, it may well be true. I will just uh, talk briefly about Thailand and Myanmar or Burma. Uh, these are examples from Varavati and from the, probably the Sri Kasetra site. Uh, there's been a lot of looting of these two areas. Um, there has been, especially the site of Sri Kasetra, which was an important kind of site of the first millennium that's slightly earlier than Butuan, shall we say but it seems to have had its own gold style as well. And there recently has been some interest on the part of collectors to share their information about their collections. And so there's a, a Terence Tan, for example, has recently been working on this subject and we may learn more, much more about the role of early Piu and later on Burmese culture in developing a, a style of gold working of its own. Uh, briefly, I'll talk about South Vietnam or Champa uh, one of the more interesting and unique aspects, actually, of the Cham gold work um, are these uh, multiple heads, uh, these hollow heads, which are actually called kosha covers. Uh, John Guy has written the most about these. But they're actually meant to be used in um, Hindu temples in Champa and South India. But there are more of these uh, kosha covers known from South Vietnam than are known from India. It's one of these interesting things like the Yupa inscriptions of Borneo. Uh, these are also known from India, but there are more of these known from Borneo than known from the whole of the Indian subcontinent. The same has to do with the consecration deposits that Anna Shlezka has written about. Uh, we know much more about these from their appearance in Southeast Asia than we know from the sites in India where they were presumably first developed. Uh, this is another a collection of the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore here, which is donated. And it's a silver and gold statue of a bodhisattva of Alkitishwara here. This is probably originally from South Vietnam as well. So definitely Champa, South Vietnam, did play a major role in development of the art styles of gold and the technology of gold and precious metals working in Southeast Asia as a whole. And it's quite interesting to continue to inquire about the nature of the relationship between Champa and the Philippines. Uh, not only do we have this reference from the third century in the Chinese source to iron coming from across the South China Sea, to Akeo, probably from Philippines. Um, Nina Baker has also talked about the, uh, the 11th century when we have this Chinese reference to the fact that the Cham and the probably Butuan we're both uh, uh, requesting uh, uh, the privilege from China of using the same kind of banner. So there has, seems to have been a close connection specifically between the Philippines and Champa uh, going through uh, over uh, more than a millennium. Now, these are other kinds of gold in a private collection, also probably from the Cham area. This, this seems to have been one of the kind of favorite mean, modes of expression in the Cham area during the first millennium in particular about making lots and lots of these flat recousse or chased uh, chisel kinds of forms of uh, these little squares. Uh, what exactly they represent, it's hard to tell. Some of them seem definitely connected with fertility and females, others look like solar symbols, lotuses. Without the context, again, we can't say more than uh, speculated. A house on Keo is a site in the uh, South Thai Peninsula, Siamo Malay Peninsula. Uh, it's uh, been now quite thoroughly excavated by a Thai Frank French team. And um, it's, it also dates back to this period of transition between the late centuries before history and the beginning of the historic period in Southeast Asia. 
And it also is this combination of materials that fortunately there are still enough materials either in the ground or in the possession of the local villagers there that we can also say it had these kinds of intaglio carvings uh, showing Mars here, for example. Um, these other kinds of Mediterranean style gold, including that, uh, that round object, it's actually called a duodecahedron, a 12 sided piece, which is typical of Greek gold working, in fact, because it has a kind of numerological significance there. And all these other kinds of pieces of gold also associated with the Kaosan Kao site, um, many of them with parallels in other parts of Southeast Asia in the, of about 2000 years ago. And the interesting thing about this is that this kind of analysis had been done not on the gold, but on the hard stone, some of which may well have come from the Philippines. And uh, there are three different uh, categories here, which is interesting, is that uh, you can divide this up into the technological aspects on one hand, just what were the tools made and what were the styles that were created by them. And you can divide them into three different categories based on the combination of technology, T, and S, or style. One is the South China Sea Sphere. They're both um, technology and style are South, Southeast Asian. And then you have the technology, and, and where the technology is um, imported from, uh, it seems to be more typical of South Asia, South India, whereas the style is in South, South China Sea types. So you have this combination of technique and style, which is both local, technology, which is different, which is imported, but the style is local. And then you have the purely in Indian imports, technology and style, both Indian. So the question there is, um, to what extent was there technological transfer? Were there Indian craftsmen working in uh, South Thailand, but making Southeast Asian style artifacts, or did Southeast Asian uh, stone carvers actually learn from the Indians how to use Indian techniques and then employ them themselves. This is a question we probably will never answer, but it shows that already over 2,000 years ago, this kind of technological transfer was taking place. Now, moving ahead to the historic period, the Butuan era, uh, of course, a lot of these sites from this area that we know of so far are the ports in the Straits of Malacca region. But we know also that uh, the Champa region was quite important as a way uh, point beyond the travels between the South China region and uh, the Straits of Malacca. This is from Pierre-Yves Mongen's uh, art article about this in the Bulletin des Côtes Françaises Extreme Orient. And of course, it shows why you have to avoid certain parts of the South China Sea because it's very dangerous to sail through them. And so how do you get from, say, Luzon or Palawan uh, to South Vietnam, to the Mekong Delta, or to the southeast coast of uh, Vietnam. You can't sail straight across. You have to uh, know your way to go through the channels between those two areas of shoals and banks at the northwestern corner, corner of the South China Sea and the southeastern corner. But it seems obvious that people were doing this. Now, um, what to the reason, of course, for stopping off in South Vietnam and, the, the, and all these periods right up until the 20th century would have been to take on more water and provisions, maybe repair any damage that took place to your spars or your masts of your ships. But what route was taken, this is only, uh, we know about this one possible route, which would have taken you from, say, the Manila area, west and then south or north. But what is not shown on this map, because it's probably not mentioned in the early Portuguese sources, are the links between the South Philippines and the Maluku area. It's quite likely that there was a, another route going down from the Philippines um, across the northern part of Sulawesi and then onto the Spikes Islands as well. But because it's not written about in any early sources, uh, we're not able to actually say for sure when it existed or what its repercussions were. But this is something for future archaeologists to look at. Now, Solheim and the later scholars, who, such as Peter Bellwood, who worked on Southeast Asian pottery, have long pointed out the connection between the South uh, Vietnam area and the Philippines in terms of its early earthenware pottery. The Sahuin Kalanai type and its related form, the Bao Malay, which spread into much of early Southeast Asia, but first appears in the, the Southern Philippines. Uh, Sahuin type motives, again, it shows uh, 
another kind of evidence for this connection between the Philippines and the, the South Vietnam area. So where the Cham came from? Did the Cham just originate in place or did they migrate to the South Vietnam area from some either along the south coast of China or from the Philippines? Uh, these are both possibilities which archaeology doesn't allow us to point to um, uh, choose between. All we can say is that there was a very strong connection already 2,000 years ago at the beginning of the historic era. Things like the Ling Ling O and these kind of bicephalus ornaments, these are some found in the Philippines. And the, the ones on the left are in the, the museum in Ho Chi Minh City, which were found in the Okeo culture, identical. And uh, of course, the, the materials themselves don't occur in South Vietnam. They came from either Taiwan or the Philippines. And so they were probably made elsewhere and then imported. Now, gold work in the Okeo area, most of this, again, is not from archaeological sites. These are from Malare's work on the Alkeo area, and they show this kind of uh, 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 ear ornament, which uh, we have this uh, kind of double-ended, curled inward, uh, inverted type of ear ornament, which we find uh, already at Alkeo, so no doubt predates the seventh century, could go back as early as the third or fourth century, and uh, it probably then continued to evolve in Southeast Asia over time. Now, where it originated, again, we don't know. We also have these gold plaques, these little gold foil objects here. These continue to be made as well. Uh, these are early examples of Javanese items. Once again, cannot be dated precisely, but to, to by style, we would say that these are possibly 1,500 to 2,000 years old. Um, very similar types of uh, ornaments from the very simple to the very complex. Uh, some of them were drawn wires. Uh, some of them were just rolled out. Uh, and so there, there are various techniques of making them, which we still need to have more people working on. So these are from, this is comparison of the same kind of material shows its diffusion within the kind of Malayo Polynesian sphere. Uh, South Vietnam in the fifth century, estimated Java from the early classic period, sixth through ninth, and from up right until the 19th century, Samar, Old Bon Talk, one can still see the perpetuation of this. Uh, in some areas, especially in the Philippines, the kind of fondness for retaining the old styles, which in other parts of Southeast Asia um, were replaced by others. We can begin to get more ideas about how gold fit into Southeast Asian culture by the 8th or 9th century when we start to get narrative reliefs. This is an artist's conception of the Temple of Wodobundur, which was constructed in the first half of the 9th century. And it has these many, many narrative reliefs and includes uh, lots and lots of depictions of ascetics on it. And uh, it emphasizes also the importance of long distance sailing and trade. It shows the outrigger. So it's not an Indian type ship. It's known to be a Southeast Asian type ship of the type which is identified with the, uh, the Malayo Polynesians. And here we have, according to the text from which this is taken, the goldsmith's chop. Uh, in this particular case, it seems to be uh, uh, um, connected with also a sale of cloth. We have cloth draped over a uh, kind of a bar in between the goldsmith and the buyer here. And you can see someone is weighing something on a scale. So this is how a Javanese of the ninth century would have actually conceptualized the goldsmith shop. We have lots of inscriptions from the ninth century of Java which mention goldsmiths in them. And they are regulated by the government because apparently they had to pay tax. Some of them would go into these tax exempt areas around temples. Um, and so we know that the number of goldsmiths who could actually live near temples and therefore escape taxation was limited by royal decree. Uh, we also know that um, goldsmiths enjoyed relatively high status. They were mobile, but they also worked in markets. So from these inscriptions, we can uh, glean a fair amount of information about the role of the goldsmith in society, but things like uh, crucibles, uh, molds, and so on, there's very little research has been done on this. So the ones that I found in Kodachina, for example, are, are still some of the few we can probably assign to gold workshops themselves. And uh, the other place where I actually had a chance to find some of these is Singapore, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And maybe first we should take a bit of a break here now. Um, so, Father Tony, do you think this would be a good time for us to maybe take a five-minute uh, coffee break?
All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Mixik. I guess, uh, given all the images and the information that we have so far received, yes, maybe it might be good uh, to take a short break. Okay. So we'll see you uh, in five minutes or so. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Mixik.
That was really nice. I wish it was longer. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll continue now with uh, So, uh, talking about Bodo Bodur, and as I mentioned, we can get some information that's not preserved in the text by looking at the reliefs of Bodo Bodur. And here we, we see a rain of jewels coming from the sky. This is a particular kind of a story about a king who can actually make gold rings fall out of heaven. And so here we have people grasping these rings as they fall from the sky, collecting them in baskets and so on. Um, rings in particular seem to have had a a strong influence on the Javanese. These are actually mentioned in inscriptions as Sim Sim Prasada Bo, or uh, temple rings. We don't know exactly what they look like. Probably some of the rings we have in the Hunter Thompson collection, for example, are these temple rings. We don't exactly know what distinguished them from other rings. So we also know that the Javanese did make money. They developed their own coinage system by the ninth century and it was a bimetallic coinage system, silver on the left, the gold on the right. And they had uniform standardized weights of several different uh, sizes or denominations. Uh, the, some of them have this, this character, a Sanskrit or Javanese, old Javanese character, which uh, stands for the weight. Uh, so it doesn't have any royal or religious significance whatsoever. Uh, just has uh, standardized stamps on it. It's called a, the, the kind of square decoration on the left is called the sandalwood flower. Uh, so it doesn't seem to have any other symbolism. But we know that the Javanese then already had a cash economy by the ninth century. Uh, but Java doesn't have or has also very little gold or silver. Whereas Sumatra and Borneo and Sulawesi, all of them have uh, abundant amounts of gold and silver. It's quite possible that the gold uh, and maybe even the money itself was imported from Sumatra. This is a, this a site of Mora Jambi, which was a period, same period as Butuan, uh, 10th to 13th centuries. Uh, lots and lots of brick Buddhist remains here. And in uh, this particular case, like some of these uh, gold coins were found in conjunction with one of the deposits under one of the temples. Uh, and so there, so a few of these uh, Coins also have been found in other sites like Barus and Northwest Sumatra, but so far we have no evidence for an actual place of production for any of them. It's just another one of the many gaps in our knowledge about early Southeast Asian society and precious metals in particular. Uh, the, the, the rings themselves are many different varieties. Some of them have uh, these characters carved into them, uh, mostly just meaning things like luck or prosperity a good fortune and so on, uh, many, many varieties. Um, you can see all the different kinds of carvings on the ones below. Uh, some of them might actually have been personal stamps. We don't know whether the Javanese actually use them as a kind of seal rings or not. Uh, these are some of the other kinds of very beautiful decorations of probably the late central Java period by the uh, ninth century. Of course, Java was very prosperous, but uh, by the end of the ninth century, the whole Javanese Central Javanese kingdom fell apart and disappeared. Uh, we don't really know why, what happened. But um, by the mid uh, 10th century, the whole center of the Javanese court had shifted to Eastern Java. Some of these then date from the, um, the late Central Java period. But then the Butuan period, oddly enough, uh, coincides with a period about which we know very little about Java. So we have a lot of gold from Butuan from this period, uh, but it's, it's a gap in our knowledge about Javanese gold. It's fascinating from that point of view. Uh, here we have another scene. This is from the Hindu temple of Prambanan, also central Java, ninth century. Here it depicts a scene out of the Ramayana where we have uh, Garuda. Now this is a Garuda at the lower right. It looks pretty much like any old parrot, but he's got a ring in his mouth. You can just see. And here he is bringing this ring to Rama and Lakshmana to say that he has located the kidnapped queen, uh, the Sita, the wife of uh, Rama. And, he, and so he, he brought his her ring to show them that he actually had found her. So here the ring serves, serves as a particular identifying characteristic of Sita. So this shows what how personalized rings may have been. This is one reason why gold is 
such an interesting subject to study in general because it has a very um, strong connection with personal preferences. So many gold styles, uh, such a uh, rapidly changing form of for personal adornment and art. Gold is very sensitive to lots of different short-term kinds of events and currents in society. And that's one reason why both it's hard to find because it doesn't get preserved very long, gets melted down, recast, but also why if you do find it, it can be a very sensitive indicator of lots of aspects of society and personal preferences. So there's a Garuda, and we will see, of course, more Garudas as we go on. And so bees, bees uh, is another kind of a motif which had a lot of symbolism in Javanese society, just like the birds and the bees in English. It actually does refer to love. And so we have these bee rings, they were quite popular. These are small ornaments, ear ornaments in Java. And this is how they might have been worn. And here's some more of these bee rings here. And uh, these other kinds of arm armlets may well have been worn on the upper arm. Kalat bahus are sometimes called in Indonesian. And this is one example of them. This comes from the Wono Boyo hoard. So this Wono Boyo hoard was discovered by accident on the lower slopes of Mount Merapi near Yogyakarta. And uh, fortunately, it was reported within a relatively short period of time to the archaeologists and the authorities after its discovery. And, and so although some pieces may have been lost, uh, it seems like a, at least a very large uh, quantity of the gold was preserved and is now in the Indonesian National Museum in Jakarta, including lots and lots of those uh, pieces of gold coins. Some of them are these kind of ear adornments. This is probably how they were worn, earplugs worn by both men and women. And this is one of the pieces again in the collection, showing this particular kind of four-sided decoration. Uh, sometimes the gold was also used for statues, but not very often. Uh, gold and silver uh, statues are usually quite small for obvious reasons, but bronze seems to have been by far the most common kind of metal used in the statuary, but there are a few uh, gold-plated or gold-foil-covered uh, uh, statues, such as these Buddhist ones here. And then uh, another way that gold often took uh, a role in religion was as these kind of consecration deposits, which Anna Chleska wrote about. And so these various kinds of symbols uh, were then buried as kind of the foundations in the, in the foundations of the temples, and they're used to protect the temple from any kind of evil influences. And we do have some records in Chinese sources of cremations and disposal of the ashes of high-class people in gold containers. This one on the left may have been one of these gold containers used for uh, some kind of cremation deposits. We have these mounts also, probably in this case, for uh, a water container or pouring vessel or a kundi or kundika. The, both the uh, cover for the top, kind of in the shape of a Buddha stupa, and then the spout here in the form of a dragon. But the actual vessel itself may well have been made out of just some kind of local clay, local earthenware. That's from the Hunter Thompson collection. We also have these kinds of probably uh, or decorations for the kind of cast cords that were worn by the priests or people of the upper echelons of society, the Brahmanas or the Kshatriyas. Usually they've lost their gems, but in this particular case, these uh, hard stones have been preserved, fortunately. And uh, often these were actually found in rather, rather remote places. This uh, statue of a man and a woman on the left was actually found in a cave site in a rather remote part of central Java. And um, some of these other, uh, actually a large quantity of gold was found in this highland site in central Java known as the Dieng Plateau. Dieng comes from Dihyang, an old Javanese meeting place of the ancestors. And a large number of Hindus uh, and a few Buddhist structures were built up here in the 8th, 9th centuries. Uh, when the British ruled Java for a brief period during Raffles reign between 1811 and 1816, he recorded that uh, the Dieng area had lots and lots of gold that the locals were continually discovering. And they were digging it up and they were using it to pay their taxes with. So there was a lot of gold in this area. It was so common that they could actually pay their tax. But also, of course, 
removed it from our purview for studying it. These are more religious objects from the Wono Boyo board. Production of holy water is still important in Balinese religion today, Agamatirta, as they call it. And the production of this was probably an important function of the priests in ancient Java as well. Some of them are these dippers with these fancy uh, handles like this one. Some of them are actually imitating materials of natural substances, probably either leaves or coconut shells. This is a close-up of one particular bowl from the Wono Boyo hoard, which is decorated with these repousse depictions of uh, scenes from the Ramayana again. Here, this is another one. Here's a close-up of this particular one. So there's fantastic gold work, very seldom preserved. We're very lucky that the Wono Boyo materials were preserved and they're now in the National Museum in Jakarta. Here we have the abduction of Sita by Rawana. Now Makaras, we have these two kinds of uh, ear ornaments which were particularly popular. One was the Makara, this kind of mythical beast composed of, of several different animals, it has an elephant's trunk, usually has a, a tiger's paws, may have a, a whale's body and so on. Makaras were also a symbol, a particular symbol in Java and in India of the god of love, Kama. So these actually had a kind of romantic connotation attached to them and they were very popular. Um, various forms of them were made over different periods. Other kinds of ear ornaments are extremely uh, ornate. These probably date from the later period, maybe the 13th through the 14th or 15th centuries. In central Java, relatively nice and um, um, simple, uh, whereas in the later East Javanese period, it became extremely ornate, complex, very busy, a very different kind of aesthetic in the East Javanese period. So at least we can use this kind of stylistic difference between simplicity and um, highly decorated, highly ornate and busy kind of work to differentiate between the, the two periods, the East Java and the Central Java period, separated by that interregnum in between them, done through the 12th centuries. Another kind of ornament which was Quite popular, uh, at least to judge from the Hunter Thompson collection, are these many, many tiny little rings here, with often with uh, beads or hard stone ornaments inserted in them. And uh, my hypothesis is that these were for birds. We know that bird keeping is still a popular kind of pursuit in Java today. It's not only China, Southeast Asia, and also had this kind of custom of rearing and sawing birds. And, my hypothesis is that these are just big enough to fit over the uh, leg of a bird. Of course, other people think they were still inserted in the ear, which is equally possible. But I like to think this is a particular category used for pet birds. You'll never know for sure. Uh, though there's a particular style associated with the Diang Plateau. We don't know for sure whether this is where they were always made or used, but at least this kind of very simplistic kind of ornamentation with these kind of ascetic figures on them, we identify these with the Dieng Plateau and the importance of the ascetics in particular as a symbol used in gold jewelry. And there's continuity into classical times from the prehistoric period, importance of mountains like the Dieng Plateau and other mountains and springs on them. These are from the East Javanese period. So they show that some of the prehistoric kinds of associations between ancestors, mountains, water, these continued from the prehistoric era right into the classical and into modern times. And so it is important as Victor Estrella has noted. And this is the site of, uh, Mount, this is Mount Lawu, one of the most important sacred mountains in central Java, where there's still a modern kind of a Javanese temple. There are still some Javanese who practice what they believe is a continuation of ancient Javanese pre-Indic religion here. And this is one of the temples built in the 15th century, which seems to be a kind of a throwback. This is Chandi Suku uh, to that pre combination of the kind of Indic religions and the pre existing cult of the ancestors. And so, this is one of the beautiful scenes that you can get from being on these high mountains in the very early morning. As the sculpture of just one of these kind of bearded men, who we think are the ascetics, so besides the Buddhists and the Hindus 
the Javanese just continued to emphasize the role of the Rishi in Sanskrit or just the guru, the teacher, as a kind of source of wisdom. Uh, now, the belief of shipwreck, before I go on, of course, is important because it's a ninth century time capsule and it had these kinds of Chinese gold and silver objects on them. A very Chinese in style, but of course, the ship sank. And as far as we can tell, uh, Chinese gold working or metalworking in general didn't have any kind of influence on the Southeast Asian artists until much more recent times, the colonial period, essentially. So the Blitung shipwreck had these kinds of emblems on them. Uh, one of them is, of course, this tray on the right with a kind of swastika, a very stylized and plant form, which is a Buddhist symbol. It's often said that the ship was going to back to the Persian Gulf because that's probably where it originally was built, in Oman. But of course, we don't know that for sure. And other people, myself included, have the idea that this was actually going to Java because we know that there is quite a bit of diplomatic activity, missions going back and forth between Java and China in this late uh, Tang period, the early ninth century. And this is the period when Borobudur and Prambanan were being constructed. Uh, this is a period when we know that uh, Java was seen as a very prestigious uh, kind of a part of, of the Chinese sphere of, of communication and trade. So it's quite likely, in my opinion, that this cargo was intended for Java and not for the Near East. So we have these kinds of Southeast Asian objects incorporated into Chinese art. These are this, uh, hairpins and combs. The thing at the lower left is a Chinese comb. They actually made these combs out of tortoise shell. And the tortoise shell came from the South China Sea. Some probably came from Western Indonesia. Some may have come from the Philippines as well. There's a royal monopoly in Imperial China. So this indicates actually a kind of communication between China and Southeast Asia where Southeast Asian materials were incorporated into Chinese uh, gold working rather than the other way around. Another shipwreck uh, besides the, the uh, Belitung shipwreck in the same general area is the Chitterbone shipwreck, which is from the period between the Tang and the Song, uh, early 10th century. And it's important because it was a Southeast Asian ship. It's not a Chinese, it's not an Arab Dao. It is a Southeast Asian ship. It had lots and lots of Chinese objects, including coins, ceramics on board. It also had Southeast Asian objects, including Southeast Asian gold on board. So this is a handle kind of like that dipper handle that we saw from the Wono Boyo site. But as I said before, Java does not seem to have had any gold of its own in ancient times. The gold, or even the raw material had to be imported from other islands, or maybe the finished products actually were imported and reworked on Java. So this, we don't know whether this handle was made in Java, somehow got on a ship which went to Sumatra and then coming back to Java again, much more likely to assume this was actually made in Sumatra and that much of what we call Javanese gold is actually Sumatran gold. But how are we gonna tell this without any kind of a technical analysis of the metallurgy? So we don't know for sure, but we're understanding more and more that where we find gold doesn't necessarily mean it was made in that general area. There obviously was a lot of gold being transported around the South China Sea. Uh, these objects also, these small mounts for uh, swords and so on. If we find them both in Java and on shipwrecks, they could have been imported again from other areas. Here we have some more of these objects from the Chitterbone shipwreck, not only including a uh, kind of corroded gold uh, mixed with other gun materials, probably copper, but even a little uh, kind of a, a bench for a goldsmith to work on. So even a goldsmith himself may have been on the ship. The Intan is another shipwreck, again from approximately the same period, uh, ninth, 10th centuries, has these kind of rings, Javanese type rings, Chinese uh, ceramics on board, these uh, uh, kind of modesty covers, as they're called, the chopping, which are also used by the, often by young children and so on. So there was a lot of gold on board this ship, again, probably going to Java, not coming from it, even though it has this kind of script on it. And uh, even more, much more recent times, like in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot of gold has been being dug up from the bottom of the Musi River in South Sumatra. So of course, uh, South Sumatra, the Musi area was the capital of the kingdom of Srivijaya, which Pierre-Yves has written 
quite a bit. And these objects, again, these are the first of their kind. These are uh, being uh, scooped up from the bottom of the Musi River. And they are, again, both handles, and they're also kind of molds for rings. Uh, another indication that a lot of what we call Javanese gold is actually Sumatran, even maybe South Sumatran gold. And most of this, again, is going straight into the antique market and not being recorded by archaeologists, very sad. So it comes from down here, about uh, 90 kilometers upstream. Underneath the rivers, uh, people are now actually uh, getting quite successful at diving down with their hoses and so on. Okay, on to ancestors, of course. This is from Jojo Versalas. He gave me this picture of an excavation that he did in Cebu. And of course, we know that there also, people were being buried with gold ornaments, but it was not only in Cebu or not only in the Philippines that this was going on, even during the Butuan period. Uh, it was also going on in places like uh, Western Indonesia, quite close to Singapore. These are the islands of Riau, south and east of Singapore. And um, back in the 1990s, there was a lot of looting of graves going on in that area. And it seems like there was a lot of burial being conducted during, say, the uh, 13th, 14th centuries, rather than cremation. So whereas people like in the ports of Sumatra and Singapore, for the most part, would have been cremating the dead. People in the nearby, nearby islands were still continuing this kind of ancestor worship, burying the dead with ornaments. And these are the only two pieces of gold that were ever shown to me that came from them. They said there was lots of gold there, but they melted it all down, as usually happens. But it's very similar to types of other ornaments that we found from the region. So here's a guy showing me exactly how they located the graves using an iron rod. And the Chinese ceramics of the Yuan Dynasty, 14th century, uh, Chinese glass bracelets, um, uh, bronze items, which are probably locally made, like this candy at the bottom, uh, Chinese mirrors, people dredging things up from other rivers in the Rio area, right up until the 17th, 18th centuries, is kind of a European, but depicted in a Chinese piece of porcelain, beads, uh, Islamic period coins, um, huge quantities of material, right until the early 20th century. This is a picture from a Dutch book, written about Indonesian gold jewelry in the 19th, or actually in the 1920s. Um, Pirngadi, Mas Pirngadi and Jasper, uh, and Jasper. And it says that the Rio area at this period was still a major place where gold working technology was highly advanced right into the early 20th century. They didn't have gold locally, but they imported gold and the goldsmiths of the islands there who were not part of the major kingdoms were still renowned for their gold working capabilities. And that's one of the items of the lower right there, which is still in possession of one of the local people about 25 years ago when I was exploring the region. Um, still very high quality craftsmanship. And right into the 19th, 20th century, a crown from Sumatra. Um, there's much, much more of this kind of material to be worked on. But let me now go in, uh, to talk briefly about the Butuan, where I'm not going to talk much about it because I'm not an expert about it, it's about the Ayala collection, of the Luxin collection, and comparative perspective, as, as I said uh, long ago, it's, um, the collection is great, both in terms of size of objects, a uh, no, number of items, the diversity, all these things make the Luxin Ayala collection very important. We have these, again, handles, uh, you make, making of detachable handles in a recognizably non-Indonesian style, much more Philippine, style or possibly uh, Bornean style as well, very characteristic of Utuan. Uh, these kind of cord handles again, or cord weights again, probably from Utuan. We don't find anything like this in the Western part of Indonesia, but we do find that these piloncitos. And so the name actually comes from the Philippines, a uh, set in uh, the Kayamanan book to be from the Laguna area. These are pretty similar to the ones from Java and Sumatra, but whether they were made in Indonesia or the Philippines, we still don't know for sure. And they might've actually been made in the Philippines. What it shows us is that there was a kind of a pan Malayo polynesian idea about the economy, uh, the standardization of the weights and the coins. And of course there is, uh, so the idea of the uh, use of, coin, of gold in the highlands and in these kind of non-urban non centers like Sumatra, more and more evidence for this is coming out. Like this is a religious site of the 13th, 14th, no, sorry, 
10th, 11th century in Highland Sumatra, Padang Lawas. Again, these people had access to their own gold, used it to make these kind of um, plates. This is from another area in central Western Sumatra. Again, we have Buddhist stupa. So the idea of the central islands, highlands as being remote from civilization, primitive, dominated by the lowlanders is definitely not true. And of course we have the Laguna copper plate inscription uh, dated to the year 900, very interesting period in uh, history. And it shows that uh, there was already a complicated system of debt repayment, or in this case, debt forgiveness. And it's unfortunate that we only have this one piece so far, but it gives us an insight into the actual complexity of the Philippine economy and society at this time. So is that it was uh, quite similar in its complexity and its idea of uh, debts and use of uh, standardized materials for exchanges and so on in the Philippines too. And these other kinds of materials. Again, they have some similarities to the Indonesian ones, these kind of collars, but then the decorations in terms of these bird shapes, these are different. Again, the use of flat um, dangling kind of pieces as decorations, that's a kind of widespread Malayo Polynesian uh, concept, but the, the objects supposedly from Butuan, again, they have different local styles. These kinds of containers, again, from Butuan or from the Luxin Ayala collection. Again, we can see the idea of the container is being standardized, but the decorations, again, different between the different regions. Um, and of course, the, the belts, uh, supposedly in Cambodia also, there were quite a few belts discovered, but very few of them have been preserved. But the belts are pretty much a unique uh, feature of the Tuan area. We don't find these in other parts of Southeast Asia, and these large curving ornaments. Like we do find these in other parts of Southeast Asia where, in general, uh, people did not employ very many Hindu or Buddhist or Indic kind of decorations. Okay, Makaras and uh, Kinara. First the Kinara here and then the Garuda. I've already talked about Garuda and I'll talk a bit more about Garuda. Now these are both obviously uh, taken from Indic decorations which then got picked up by the Malayal Polynesians both in Indonesia and uh, obviously in at least the Butuan area. But they are uh, the, the, now the, these kind of ear ornaments in the shapes of Garudas here. Uh, we can't really say where they were made. It seems like this may have been a motif which actually did travel uh, to the South Philippines and was remade there by local goldsmiths. But this Kinara is unprecedented. Uh, this is a, these are Kinara in the upper right, that's from the Borobudur, so you can see the legs are very important here. They're bird-like. Uh, this is from the ninth century again, but the upper bodies are very human-like. Uh, but this one from um, Mutuan probably is, is just an amazing piece. If you look at the face, for example, the facial features of this. There, I have a blow-up of that one. So the facial features of these are so naturalistic. Uh, it's just a fantastic piece of the way the the portraiture of the individual, the kind of facial expression on this is, is a local local feature. It's very naturalistic, but it has a kind of emotional content, which I think is pretty unique in Southeast Asian sculpture in general. And um, that's kind of wistful. And of course, the Kinara Kinari, they're often in pairs uh, because there's a story on Borobudur about the, the, the female and the male Kinara. Kinari who were separated for one night by a flood and so they cried for a thousand years as a result. They're so in love with each other. And this one also kind of conveys that kind of wistful feeling, this uh, kind of a sadness almost. And the body, the way the body here, the, the feathers are depicted again. This is just so detailed. Um, I, I don't know of any other piece of gold work that has this kind of level of detail of showing this kind of feather work. It's just an amazing piece. Whereas the the statue from Agusan, Anina Baker, of course, has made a, a very important identification of this. Uh, with the, the Nganju bronzes from Java, which is a set of over 100 little bronze statues, and this particular one for a long time, I couldn't figure out uh, what kind of gesture. I thought this gesture was just some kind of a, a weird one-off thing, but now Anina Baker has identified it as a Wajra Lasha. It's actually one of the mudras uh, assumed by one of the statues in this Nganjuk mandala. 
So it is an actual port, uh, depiction of a particular motif, which is found in um, uh, kind of Javanese and Indian esoteric art as well. So it does show that this is not just a portrait of a, of a woman, though it may well be that also, but she is actually assuming a particular posture, which has a, uh, a meaning. Now, whether or not there were a hundred other statues at the same place that this one came from, we'll probably never know. Um, but it is actually it does show that the familiarity, not only the familiarity with him, kind of Hindu Buddhist art was known in Butuan, but actually there was at some point an actual effort to apply it and shows that it may have had more impact on at least this particular group of, of Philippine society than elsewhere in the Philippines. Whereas most areas, I think it was more typical of Zomia, where there was a conscious intention to preserve Filipino styles in the face of these foreign imports. Again, I can't get tired of looking at this piece. It's just such an amazing piece. It's one of the, the most spectacular pieces of portraiture of sculpture from Southeast Asia as a whole. I just love this piece. And so we have these regional styles, we have political evolution, long distance contacts, all these things can be discussed, discussed using the Wuchuan material, but that's not my particular field, so I'm gonna skip over that. And um, just to say that the excavations, there have been very few controlled excavations from which this, these materials have been found, but of course, uh, the Loxins did sponsor this excavation, which Nina uh, Baker has talked about before, back in 1981. So we do have at least a couple fixed points in the Philippines for which we can then calibrate the rest of our studies of objects which don't have any uh, concrete provenance. And the, the Chinese wares here also help us to pinpoint the chronology. And we know from other work, that this is by Laura Yunker in the Bias region, her studies of settlement patterns, that there was complicated uh, settlement patterning in a place like Negros, the Tanhai area. Again, this is very important. It's not been replicated in any other part of Southeast Asia that I know of, but the, the Philippines has made its mark also on this kind of theoretical application of archeological models, now showing that these four different periods in the Philippines did show a particular evolution and a development of a hierarchical settlement pattern back up into the 1400s to the 1600 era, this so-called Osmena phase. So there's lots more potential in the Philippines, which Filipino archeologists are making a great contributions toward. Uh, Crease hilts again, uh, these are another kind of important thing, which has a specifically Javanese or Balinese connotation. This is from the Leonard Thompson collection um, and these kinds of uh, plates here. Now, this is uh, from a Javanese poem. There was a ruined temple, a ruined Chandi. The demonic masks looked as if they were crying silently. So this is a composed uh, back in the 14th century. And this is probably one of these masks, but it's not meant to be on the face. It's meant to be over the lower abdomen, shall we say. And here it shows the story of the Arjuna Viwaha itself. This is Arjuna meditating while these two uh, 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 female deities are attempting to distract him from his ascetic um, practice. Now here is a Garuda. So we talked about the importance of Garuda and the ear ornaments. And here are Garuda statues from that site on the mountain of uh, Mount Lao Chandi Suku. And this particular statue is wearing one of these. It's also identified as, as having been worn over the lower abdomens by the ascetics, by the monks. And here we have another one of these. It was a focus of high artistic endeavor. Here we have the story of a woman uh, and then this particular story, the woman was unjustly killed by her husband in a fit of jealousy, where she was innocent. And so these kind of gold plaques then were often made taking these various kinds of themes from literature. And so Garuda was imported in the 15th century in uh, Javanese art and sculpture. And so these uh, ear ornaments may well derive from this very late prehistoric or say pre-colonial period. Garuda was a very important figure at that late phase 15th century. And so this is where this particular one may well have been worn, by, maybe by a man who was pretending to be a Garuda. I'll just mention briefly, we have found a little bit of gold in Singapore when we were excavating on Fort Canning. This one actually was discovered back in the early 1920s. It's one of these figures of these monster faces, again, the Kala masks. And this is the Singapore one compared to a statue 
This is from Sumatra from the 14th century of this very large portrait of a king. But by this time, esoteric Buddhism was very popular in the Malay, Malayo Polynesian realm, shall we say. And he's wearing exactly the same kind of jewelry as his belt buckle. So this shows that Singapore in the 14th century was definitely a part of this Malayo Polynesian sphere of gold working. And we did find evidence that there was gold working some more clay crucibles on the Fort Canning site. Makaras also were uh, still continued to be popular in Southeast Asia today. Makara is this kind of, a, off, it was often used as a spout, whether it's on a temple, it's in the upper right here, for the water, the drainage water off of Wodobudur. Here it's a, used as a spout for probably one of these little kendis or ewers. And Singapore's national emblem, the Makara, or the Mer Lion, is actually pretty much very similar to a Makara, except instead of a, an elephant here, we have a lion. So it's a singa in Sanskrit, the Singapura. But it's very similar to really, really has a kind of precedence in really Southeast Asian art. And here are some Makara ornaments also from the Minangkabau area, West Sumatra. So it was known um, in really a Malay, a Malay realm as well as in the Javanese realm. And finally to uh, East Java, the Majapai kingdom of the 14th century. These are some of the ruins on that particular site. Um, and here, after we did some archaeological survey with some students, um, the local villagers actually told us and uh, actually donated to the government some local gold jewelry they had discovered. This is an indication of how local people, if they're properly educated, are actually quite interested in contributing to scholarship. This is obviously a very nice kind of a combination of several bees together as a kind of a pendant. And here we have other pieces of uh, gold, which were found at the same place, which the local name for that village today is Kamasa, which comes from the word mas, which means gold. And so it may well have been an ancient gold working place. And these are some more pieces of gold, which look like they're crumpled up, ready to have been melted down and recast, which for some reason then ended up getting buried instead and never reworked. And here we have some little crucibles also from the same site and even a little anvil suggests that already this kind of anvil for maybe for making rings or casting other kind of elements was already known in 14th century Java among the goldsmiths. And these, these kind of objects also, um, these have been discovered, no provenance, but they're from the East Java area showing how glorious some of the gold working was from East Java during the 14th, 15th centuries. And it still continues to be very important today in the local marriage ceremonies using still some of these emblems we can trace back some of the symbolism of this to the pre-Islamic period. This is in Sumatra. And uh, here we have the Makara again, and the Makara was still used right up until 17th, 18th century in other contexts. Here we have a, a battle flag used by the people of Sulawesi, the Bugis. They were using Islamic script on their flag, but they were riding on this kind of Makara uh, type uh, vehicle. And here we have the kind of thunderbolt. So this is Indra writing on the kind of Makara. So this is the kind of continuity between pre-Islamic and Islamic art in Indonesia. And of course, the Bugis area is right on the borderline uh, between the Philippines and Indonesia. The, the Bugis area still remains to be studied. We know that the, the idea of, um, of sacrificing buffaloes in some areas there still continues today in the Taraja area, for example. This is a Another one of these uh, early 20th century photographs of one of these very large buffalo sacrifice ceremonies going on. And they still buried the dead and they still created those kinds of ancestor figurines. And so this area still has been very little studied. There are some pieces of evidence that Buddhism was known in Sulawesi, such as this bell with the kind of bajra on the top. But mostly the area was still making and using these kinds of eye covers, face covers, Dong's own drum. So this kind of part of eastern Indonesia near the Philippines was still an area where you could find these both the continuity with the pre-Indic past and uh, some adaptation of at least in some areas of these Indic uh, ideas. And later on, of course, the Bugis became very well known also for their gold work. These are Bugis warriors. Of course, Bugis later on became known in uh, England as the Bogeyman. And so the Bogeyman actually is a Bugis man. And uh, so they were well known as fierce warriors. They expressed a lot of their artistic inclinations in metalwork having to do with weaponry. 
We don't have anything like the Boxer Codex, unfortunately, for Indonesia. We were very lucky in the Philippines to have that early depictions. We have 19th century Dutch depictions of some of the ethnographical way objects, these kinds of pieces of gold work and so forth, but nothing as early as you have for the Philippines. Uh, here are other kinds of things, uh, kettle work, uh, even the chopping until quite uh, recent 19th, 20th century, these were still worn by little children in places like uh, Malaya, Malaysia, as well as the Philippines. And these kinds of armbands, again, here we can see some continuity between Eastern Indonesia, the Bugis area, with the Philippines also, the, the use of these large plates and uh, for armbands. And this, we do have some gold in Southwest Sulawesi, the Bugis area, it does have its own gold. And this other kinds of very ornate artwork, this is a finial for, say, a staff or a flag. Also, it's very similar to those kind of thunderbolts that go back to the esoteric Buddhist period. Nias as well off the west coast of Sumatra, quite far west. But again, one can see some similarity in these kinds of very large ear, ear ornaments, very naturalistic, very modern in their styles. Um, so very simple, but also extremely aesthetic in their connotations. And uh, so right up, up until the 20th century, still the importance of gold as a status symbol. These kind of traditional societies could still be observed in places like Highland Sumatra, um, Nias area. These, these statues again, some of them also adorned with this uh, gold work, now mainly found in ethnographic museums, places like Jakarta and the Netherlands. And gold still continues to be used in various kinds of other ways as well, such as on these painted scrolls, these date from the 16th century in Java. Uh, they're called Wayambeber, and here we have this figure, um, and he's still gold colored. Actually, they use kind of a gold paint to cover the, the bodies of the gods or these kind of heroic figures in 16th century Java. 19th century Javanese manuscript written in Javanese characters, still gold was used to illuminate this particular manuscript, the, the royalty, their carriage, the horses, and so on. So the importance of gold as a symbolic um, substance will continue right up until the 20th century. Here we have a modern Balinese version of a painting using gold as a uh, way of emphasizing the divine nature of the people in the, this Balinese painting. And this is a, a very early 21st century picture, again, using gold for the ornaments. So right up until the current times, gold still retains this kind of aura about it. And so I hope I have given you a not too long and involved a picture of the context for the Filipino gold. I think it shows how important the, the Ayala Luxon collection is and the Butuan site and how hopefully other sites in the Philippines for the study and the contextualization of these various pieces of ideas about gold and society in each and Southeast Asia as a whole. Thank you very much for sticking with me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mixik. Uh, one participant in our Zoom audience uh, wanted to take time out to kind of collect her jaw from the floor <laughs> after seeing all the uh, pictures of uh, uh, gold, uh, jewelry, and other things as well. Uh, I think what Dr. Mixik has done for us this afternoon is take us really on a comprehensive uh, journey, as it were, right, uh, uh, across time, certainly, and, uh, and really a virtual tour of Southeast Asia. And I think it is pretty clear from what we have heard so far that Butuan, uh, the Philippines, uh, is, lies very much within that world of Southeast Asia and even beyond, uh, it seems, to China, to India, and even perhaps to the Mediterranean, uh, who knows, uh, and certainly uh, uh, to other places in the north as well. Okay, So I think uh, what we do have... Uh, here now present, and I would like to invite uh, speakers from uh, the previous panels. Okay, they are with us, Dr. Mitzik. Uh, I saw the name of Dr. Capistrano uh, Baker here, uh, also uh, the others, uh, if I may. Um, 
look at the gallery. Uh, I think uh, we do have uh, Dr. Kanilao with us. Uh, also, uh, Sir Kenneth uh, Esguera of the Ayala Museum. Okay, uh, Father John Young is with us no? uh, here, and uh, I would like to ask them to, if they wish, to show themselves no? to open the video cameras. And if they have questions or comments uh, to make, uh, here is a great time, given that uh, Dr. Nixik is with us. Okay. So uh, please uh, uh, do uh, show yourselves. Uh, okay, and perhaps while uh, they're doing so, um, uh, maybe I can start off, uh, Dr. Mixik, by just kind of uh, asking about uh, demographics. I wonder whether you've, whether you have any idea about, uh, since we kind of traveled really through time, right? Uh, and uh, we went on a virtual tour of so many places. I mean, it's uh, this is the most comprehensive uh, account that I've heard about. Uh, 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 gold, and this is what's interesting about it. We have one material, as it were, and then how that material is able to connect, as it were, all these places, all these societies, all these cultures. No? Uh, but uh, the, the, I, I was just thinking about the the people uh, then who who kind of produce these things and 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 consume these things, and we use it for various reasons. Um, you actually made reference to uh, other ways of uh, conceiving the relationships, for example, between people of the lowlands, of the highlands, of the coastal areas, uh, etc. But in terms of population, do you think, uh, as we traveled through time, would you have any ideas about? Uh, populations um, are we talking about big uh, towns or big uh, centers uh, or or are we talking about relatively because today when we talk about southeast asia one of the things we note would be the large populations that we have it's hard for us to imagine maybe a village uh, or a small town so i don't know whether you'd have any ideas about uh, uh, population demographics therefore yeah. Um, well, in the 16th century, when we start to get uh, European sources and descriptions, um, it seems like uh, Southeast Asia was highly urbanized. You know, there were not huge cities, but there were uh, quite a large number of towns. Um, the Europeans were fascinated. They did. They had no hesitation in calling them cities in European languages. Um, so they did. They did. And they, they said that uh, say. Um, Aceh, North Sumatra was as big as Amsterdam, because European cities are not very big <laughs> in the 17th century either, compared to the Islamic world. Um, so Europe was not highly urbanized. And then the, you know, the, the, when Magellan, Miguel Hayes came to the Philippines, the, the Europe was just emerging from the kind of dark ages. So the yes, Southeast Asia was, um, there is definitely an urban hierarchy where that's uh, what Laura Juncker is. So, information shows us. Um, archaeologists in the past have not been very interested in studying the remains of early cities, have been much more interested in temples and sculptures and jewelry, and not so much in the actual habitation sites of the people. So, uh, but from what we can see from the early ethnographic descriptions, 16th century Southeast Asia did not have a big population. That the, you know, the, it was only in the 19th century that you had this real population explosion. But the proportion of population who lived in towns as opposed to out in the jungle was quite high. So Southeast Asians were urbanized. Now, there's no doubt about that. And that, that there were um, uh, quite specialized kinds of institutions that dealt with them. Um, one of the problems is that so many of them were built over water. That's what we're finding out now from all the looting that's going on in South Sumatra is that there's not much on land, but there's tons of material under the rivers. And how are we ever going to study that? So Southeast Asia's lifestyle does not you know, easily lend itself to us archaeologists finding it. And all these people who have just have their hoses and are going down with their the divers masks and hoses and scooping up artifacts by the thousands. Um, so a lot of it is being lost that way. But yes, so Southeast Asia's population figures were not high, but 
the distribution of large settlements was quite widespread. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody, uh, did I see uh, Dr. Canela uh, appear on screen? Uh, hi. <laughs> Just wanted to say, are. good to see you again, Dr. Oh God, it's Mixing. Been a long time. Yes. yes. <laughs> I've been following your work, as you can tell. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, John, would you uh, would you say that the uh, Shamp, there's a connection also with the Siam, the, the uh, Sampa Siam, or are they linguistically connected? Because we also have uh, examples of vessels in North Luzon that so, sort of resemble the Sampans that we find in the mainland. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really very sure about the origin of the, the Sampan. Um, the, the, it's not really a Southeast Asian type of vessel because the typical foundation for the Southeast Asian boats was the kind of dugout log. And Sampans usually are constructed out of planks, uh, which doesn't mean that they were, I mean, that's what I understand by the Sampan. That's what, but then I might be influenced by having lived in Chinese ports most of my life. Or a sampan literally means something that's plant constructed. Uh, so um, it's possible that uh, there were other uh, uh, origins for the that type of vessel, but for the most part, I, I think it's for what I know about the vessels. Uh, I mean, you can educate me about this. Um, are they always plank built or do they have to have dugout foundations? I mean, what is your what is your light that you can shed on this? The uh, vessel that was uh, seen in Vegan is uh, uh, yeah planks, and uh, actually they were using irons already for the fastening, uh -huh. so it's uh, not the traditional wood plank. Uh, no. You know, dowels. Yeah. No, no, that that definitely suggests to me that this comes from another tradition, not a southeast. Asian one. Okay. Thank you. Good to see you. Oh, good to see you too. <laughs> okay. And touching on boats, I guess our uh, uh, panels coming in, I guess tomorrow and the next uh, day or so would in fact be on boats, right, uh, Noel? Uh, would you want to say anything? Yes, actually, um, in the audience now is uh, Dr. Bernadette Abrera, who will be uh, speaking on the 9th. Um, and she was consultant. Uh, we have a special edition of stamps that were made. And uh, Dr. Abrera was the consultant, and she's here. And of course, her dissertation was also on both. So she's, she's speaking. Um, uh, Dr. Abrera, would you want to say something? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Noel. I am really uh, very pleased to be part of this conference and thank you very much to Dr. Mixik for a very comprehensive presentation. Um, I was really wondering, because he mentioned Gausam Keo, and I was wondering if there were already uh, direct mentions of boats uh, because there were Philippine artifacts found in that archaeological area. So I, I, regarding Philippine boats, I wonder if the, uh, those artifacts came from the Philippines uh, through Philippine boats or from other uh, boats that came to the Philippines and took them over to Kausam Keo. Uh, would there be, uh, Dr. Mixik, would there be any references on how those uh, artifacts arrived in that area? It's totally a mystery, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> we don't have any shipwrecks before the fourth century of the Christian era. Okay. So the oldest, these are like, um, Kausam Keo is like three or four hundred years earlier than that. Yes. So we have not discovered any ships from that period. Um, what we do have now is we have this kind of South China Sea sphere where we have Philippine objects showing up all the way 
on the other side in the uh, Western Malay Peninsula. Uh, and uh, of course, at the same time, we have Malayo-Polynesians exploring the Pacific Ocean. So it was definitely Malayo-Polynesian uh, people, sailors, who were doing most of the transporting at this time. There's no evidence of, say, mainland Southeast Asians building or, or sailing boats long distances at this period. Uh, it's very unfortunate that um, a lot of the shipwrecks that have been discovered recently were not documented. People document the cargoes, but they don't pay attention to the planks, mm -hmm. the wood parts. Uh, so where we do have evidence, uh, they, they tend to be mainly Southeast Asian built ships. But where in Southeast Asia they come from, it's very hard because you have the same types of construction techniques, the same kind of raw materials being used all the way from Mindanao across to um, uh, the Malay Peninsula. Yes. So it would be very difficult to pin down where in this giant area they came from. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, because even, even the Dongson drums uh, already contained uh, etchings of boats uh, and um, it is also very interesting for me uh, because I started reading on Kausam Keo uh, after I listened to one of your lectures uh, on YouTube. And then I, I found out that um, beyond the, the material artifacts, uh, there was a lot of cultural exchange really um, um, because the, um, the coffee, both coffins would be found all over, even uh, before historical sources would mention boats uh, coming from the Philippines. So the archaeological evidence is very, very rich on that uh, exchange of maritime culture. Yeah, and so it's lucky that um, also there's very good environment for preservation of these boats in the Philippines. You've got those kind of acidic soils uh, where the oxygen doesn't appear. So you don't have those kinds of worms and things actually eating the, mm -hmm. the timbers. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure just the, the, the one side of the uh, uh, the Balang Hai is just the tip of the iceberg. The, th the thing is mostly, uh, I, I suspect that uh, what happened is that that was a place for dumping old ships. <laughs> that the, when we get an old ship that's going to sink, you don't want to be out there in the middle of the ocean. So when you think your ship has about outlived its usefulness, you don't want it to sink right in the middle of the harbor either. Mm -hmm. So you would usually take it and actually have a ship graveyard. So I think that's what happened. That's why you have a concentration of these ships, no cargo for the most part, because of course they would not scuttle the ship with the cargo. Mm -hmm. So they just dumped the ship there. And I'm sure there are other places in the Philippines where you will find them, not, not right in the port, but not too far away either. But it's going to be hard to find them. They will just be mainly made out of wood and not a whole lot of other materials in there with them. So you can't really use metal detectors or other kinds of remote sensing to find them. But there's very good ch chances that you'll, I mean, in, in Sumatra, I did find pieces of wood, um, which got preserved for up to 5,000 years in a peat swamp. So just like in Europe, where you can have corpses and bogs, I'm sure in the Philippines, you also will have ships. Yes. So you just have to find the ship graveyard. <laughs> yes. Quite a tall order. <laughs> for, yes. no. We for have to our, have some ambition. <laughs> yes, yes. But thank you very much. I really appreciate the lecture. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Abrera. Uh, we do have uh, some questions from the question and answer function of our... Uh, Zoom uh, from Francis Garcia. He asks, how do ancient Asian or Southeast Asians heat up the gold in the clay crucibles? Okay. Uh, so he's asking a technical question mm. about the technology, I guess. Uh, mm. Yeah, well, of course, they had these little cups and uh, they would uh, add that borax, at least the Chinese did. I'm not sure about uh, others, but you know, borax lowers, already gold melts at a fairly low temperature. Mm 
and you had borax, it melts even easier. But still, they did have some kind of a bellows system. Um, I don't know what it was called in the Philippines. In, in Malay, it's called ububan. And it's a piston bellows, which means you just have two kind of bamboo tubes. And you have, yes, exactly, like that. And um, you can still find them used sometimes in remote areas of Indonesia. And that seems to have been a local invention. It's different from the Chinese system, for example. And so how far back that goes, again, we have no idea. There's a depiction of these actually at that temple on Maulau. There's a depiction of one of those bellows being used, but it's 15th century, relatively late. And it's being used by somebody to make a sword. So it's not a goldsmith, but they would have had those ways of getting a high temperature fairly easily. Uh, you could uh, you could melt um, gold relatively quickly using that, on a, especially if you just have a small cup to heat up, not a huge crucible full. And But they probably would have mixed other kinds of ingredients in if they knew about borax, for example, they would have used that. Um, so yes, they, they did have, uh, they had quite elaborate systems, but they since they're made out of organic material, bamboo it won't leave any traces. Once again, we're left with kind of indirect evidence. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mixik. Uh, there's another question here from an anonymous attendee. Thank you for the discussion. I just want to ask, are there archaeological evidences of Pacific Islander connections uh, with the gold from the Philippines or Southeast Asia? So kind of going the other way to, uh. Pacific, <laughs> to the Pacific ocean, the Pacific Islands, I any don't evidence? Know. Yeah. I, I'm afraid I don't know of any. Um, the only type of material which seems to have been, well, there are two kinds. There are some, some stone elements um, from New Britain, which are actually trans, uh, moved around both in the Pacific and to the Philippines. So it's a kind of a, you can make very nice rock. You can make sharp kinds of tools out of it. And of course, there's the Lapita type of pottery, which is made in some islands in the Western Pacific, but it's in kind of Malayo-Polynesian style. But when you get out to the real Pacific, you don't have good clay anymore. You either have those atolls, which are just uh, made out of calcium, or you have volcanic islands, but neither one has clay. So in the Pacific, you really can't make pottery. Uh, and they don't have gold out there either. So um, the, the only evidence for kind of transfer of technology from Southeast Asia into the Western Pacific is pottery, but no metal. Uh, there's no metal out in the Western Pacific at all. And so it never got traded that far. Okay, thank you. Uh, and another question from our uh, Q&A uh, to Dr. Mixik. Hi, sir, good afternoon. With all these national treasures and heirlooms of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asian countries, do you think these valuable, precious, historical and original tangible materials and relics, uh, if we say so, looted, outright purchased, transferred or robbed uh, by colonial masters, must be and or morally returned to their original uh, I guess, locations, uh, its owner countries. Uh, would you have any opinion on that, I guess? What can you say in this regard? <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think, I think you know, they're, they're, in principle, yes. Of course, it's never that simple. Um, but a lot, a lot depends on the circumstances under which they were removed. And in some cases, they were, of course, purchased or um, otherwise uh, taken out of the country, but for the most part, I mean, um, they were taken out illegally. Most of the, the exports have taken place in the last hundred years, uh, during which period there were already international covenants and agreements in place. Um, so definitely, um, there's, there's so many cases going on now. The U.S. government, for example, has taken a very hard line now, especially where Cambodian artifacts are concerned because so many Cambodian artifacts were looted with during the Khmer Rouge and early um, Vietnamese period. So the U.S. government is now, um, I mean, several of us archaeologists have been contacted 
by U.S. Customs authorities <laughs> and said, we think this is a genuine artifact. And would you say that this is genuine? Because other, if it is, we're going to confiscate it. So there has been a, a nice uh, reversal of attitude on the part of the authorities in the U.S. and um, museum curators now. Uh, of course, there are some who are actually in, in jeopardy of going to jail because of this. And um, so there has been a, quite a change in attitudes, both among the museological community and among the, the collectors as well. So, yes, uh, especially, I mean, Southeast Asia has been one of the worst affected parts of the world because it had such a glorious output of art and art. And there, there was so much taken out during the unrest of the early post-colonial era. And of course, some that went out during the colonial era too. So now the Netherlands, for example, has done a good job in returning lots of artifacts to Indonesia. Uh, but not all countries have done that. And uh, there's been this recent... Um, Fortunately, you know, he just had just died. There was a, a Khmer man named Tuktik. That was his nickname. He's called the Lion also. He's been much in the news. He just died of pancreatic cancer. But he, in, in his old age, he he kind of repented of his ways and uh, helping people to loot lots and lots of artifacts. And he's actually been going around to museums in the West and saying, this I looted, this myself, from this particular site in Cambodia. And this is where it came from. So this is a unique opportunity. And unfortunately, he passed away just uh, last week uh, to actually put these things back in the context of where they actually came from. So not just the country, but the actual site. And so there's still a hope these days that there are other people like him who may come forward if they're given proper encouragement, saying we're not going to put you in jail uh, if you confess to what you did. And if you help us recover your country's patrimony, uh, that, and that actually, if you tell us where the stuff came from, of course, that's what we archaeologists want. We don't want the artifacts per se, but we want the data. So it's um, we, obviously it would be nice if there were still some kind of uh, large scale exchanges of artifacts. But the, the, um, all the basic right, of course, goes back to the country where the items were made. I think yeah. there's no, no, no serious professional archaeologist would say anything else. Okay. Uh, I would imagine that there would be many more uh, of these objects in private collections that we do not know of. Uh, okay, uh, I think one question here has already been answered. Okay, uh, there is a question from uh, uh, local historian Greg Ontiveros. He oh, says, yes. I know him. Uh, yes, my greetings to Dr. John Mixick. Uh, the Song Dynasty history noted the various Butuan tribute missions to the Chinese Empire starting in 1003 CE. It states Butuan is in the sea. It has had mutual relations with Champa, but not much communication with China. The question then, may I ask if your studies on Champa showed any connection with their aesthetic designs with the gold items in Butuan? We, again, the same old problem. We have very few items from South Vietnam with good provenance, good identification as to where they came from. So I've seen uh, the area which has yielded a lot of this material is the Okeo area in the Delta, but that only takes us up until about the seventh century. Um, other sites, um, there, was, there was no really good archaeological research done in of Vietnam until very recent times. Uh, just yesterday, we had a talk uh, by a Cham archaeologist named Zhou Tung Yang um, from Hanoi, who has been working on the Champa sites. But, uh, so he was not speaking specifically about gold. Uh, there hasn't been, there have been a lot of publications about gold from the very early period, from that kind of Okeo period. But from the at the Butuan era, I don't know of any good uh, excavations. Uh, for the most part, people have been looking at more at the, the ceramics. I, I, the person to ask really would be Do, Alex Alex Zotong Young, but he didn't. He has not talked about that, and I haven't seen any real archaeological publications on this either. Uh, for the most part, what we know from the, the Cham sites are either the 
these prehistoric sites, the Sahuian type sites, which have the parallels with the Kalanai sites in Philippines, and then the, the sites with the jar burials, the Sahuian type burials, and um, a few of them that also have these kinds of uh, late uh, Chinese ceramics from the Song Yuan period. But to my knowledge, there hasn't been any good study yet done of Chaom Gold. But I, I may be wrong. I don't know. The, the, the Vietnamese are publishing a lot now in Vietnamese. And what I do read, which is in English, is mainly about the very early phase, not the kind of Wutuan era. So I may be wrong, but my impression is that there hasn't been any real intensive or comprehensive study done of this era yet, which is a shame. Okay. Uh, it is now 4.15. Uh, certainly, I think one of the takeaways as well from uh, Dr. Mixik's uh, lecture uh, this afternoon is that there, it was a comprehensive report, and yet uh, he has told us uh, at uh, several points uh, along the narrative that there's, there still remains many Many gaps remain, as it were, in our knowledge of uh, uh, gold and its place in Southeast Asia and how uh, various locations and localities in Southeast Asia relate to each other, particularly with regard to this material. So I guess, uh, in many ways, Father John Young is here and they have representatives of various uh, institutions of higher learning than maybe uh, with this talk and with the other talks as well already uh, delivered and those that are still to come, that uh, these may inspire many of our young people to take up the study of archaeology uh, and the other social sciences. Okay? And with Butuan, such an important uh, center uh, for gold craft and boat building. So uh, we encourage our participants whose questions have not been addressed this afternoon to revisit some of the previous talks. I think some of your questions have actually been answered in those talks. Okay? So I think uh, we need to thank uh, Dr. Mixi for taking time out to be to join us this afternoon and to share his knowledge with us. Um, and we are very, very grateful. And I think certainly uh, we can revisit this lecture because I am sure it will be made available uh, on YouTube or on Facebook. And uh, many of those who were not able to be present this afternoon will be able to access uh, uh, the lecture this afternoon. So uh, that was quite a learning experience then from our speaker. Uh, we also thank our participants for being engaged in our session. And at this point, uh, please allow me to read the certificate of appreciation for our speaker. Alec? While we wait, uh, I think Alec will then flash on the screen uh, the certificate of appreciation that our conveners uh, and our sponsoring institutions would like to uh, present to Dr. John Mixick. Kim uh, and Alec. Are you around? Hello, Alec. Um, can you kindly uh, share the screen? Okay, thank you. Uh, can you just uh, increase the size of the font, uh, Alec? Okay, and scroll up, please. Okay. So the Philippine International, I'm sorry, can you scroll down? <laughs> uh, the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference uh, 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 presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. John and Mexic 
further for his presentation in the Philippine International Quincentennial Conference, Session 11, entitled Early Philippine and Southeast Asian Boat Building and Gold Crafting Technology uh, on 6 to 10 December via Zoom webinar. This session is co-convened with Father Saturnino Urios University and the National Historical Commission of the Philippines. The National Quincentennial Committee was created through Executive Order Number 55, Series of 2018, to prepare the country in commemorating the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan, the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world and other related events. The Philippine International Quincentennial Conference is also in solidarity with the year of Filipino pre-colonial ancestors and the Philippine Spanish Friendship Day. Given this uh, 6 to 10 December, 27 December 2021, uh, signed Dr. René R. Escalante, Executive Director, the National Quincentennial Committee, Chair of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and Chief Convener, Philippine International Quincentennial Conference. So thank you once again, Dr. Mixic. This will be sent to you by email. Okay. So um, uh, I guess uh, now we can ask... Uh, um, Dr. Feliz Fernandez, Noel Fernandez, co-convener of this session. Rodriguez, uh, uh, Tony. I'm sorry, Rodriguez, what did I say? Fernandez. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Feliz Noel Rodriguez, co-convener of this session, uh, to tell us more about the upcoming sessions. I'm still full of gold in my head. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being with us in this panel and uh, in this panel which contextualizes all on um, uh, Butuan and Philippine gold in the Southeast Asian context. So tomorrow we begin the second part of the conference on boat building. So please join us at 9 a.m. to listen to Dr. Ligaya Laxina of the University of the Philippines. Uh, she will speak on the lush log boat building in the Philippines, a detailed look at the Butuan boats. And then in the afternoon at 2 p.m., we have first a video presentation for an hour, the Voyage of the Balangay documentary. And at three o'clock, we will have uh, Dr. Pierre-Eve Manguan uh, of the French School of Asian Studies. He will speak on the Butuan boats and Southeast Asian shipbuilding traditions. And uh, this, on the 9th, we will have uh, Dr. Um, Bernadette Abrera, uh, Ms. Agni Mokhtar, and uh, Dr. Luis Bolunia uh, to speak as well on the Balangay boats, again, or the Butuan boats. Again, this conference runs from December 6 to 10. Join us for more deep and meaningful discussions on the early Philippine and Southeast Asian boat building and gold crafting technology. On behalf of the Father Saturnino Urios University, the National Quincentennial Committee, we wish to thank those behind the scenes, the conference secretariat, uh, like uh, Joseph Alec Queradilla, and of course, thank you most of all to our speaker, Dr. John Mixick of the National University of Singapore. Thank you as well to our moderator, uh, Father Antonio de Castro. This is uh, Feliz Noel Rodriguez, co-convener of this conference, saying thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Thanks, Dr. Mixick. Welcome. John, thank you.